Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we're really excited uh, to have this webinar and uh, to present the really incredible work that um, Common Bond, one of SAFE members, has been doing. Um, today, we're going to hear them, you know, about how what we've seen time and again that preventing evictions is a good investment. Um, Common Bond did a, a report with Ernst & Young that really measures the social return of investment on this eviction prevention program. So we think this has a lot of applicability very broadly, and um, we hope that you'll um, not only get to hear about this, but also share it widely. Uh, just briefly, wanted to give those of you who are not familiar with SAFE uh, a super brief um, intro to Stewards of Affordable Housing for the Future. We're a nonprofit collaborative of 13 affordable housing providers across the country. These our members are um, multi-state providers who are committed to long-term sustainable affordable housing opportunities that uh, do the, make a difference in people's lives. And almost all of our members do service-enriched housing and lease some of their properties. And that's what we're focusing in on today. Uh, we're in all uh, 50 states except for North Dakota and serve over 200,000 people. Um, on your screen right now is a map of the safe property, so it just shows you where, where we are. Um, one of the things that we're not going to be delving into today, but is some of the work around safe um, efforts on resident services. One thing that some of you may have seen is a framework that we have worked through with our members and other partners about how to think about resident services coordination. We just wanted to highlight there's more information on our website about this, but we feel like it's really helpful and really important about um, thinking about this as a function in your organization um, and not just as kind of an ad hoc activity that happens here and there. So um, anyone who has more questions on that, uh, please send us a separate email. We're happy to, to share more information. Um, that work on that uh, framework has uh, informed our work on something called CORS, which is the Certified Organization for Resident Engagement Services. This certification recognizes owners and sponsors that have developed a robust commitment, capacity, and competency in providing resident services in their affordable rental homes. Um, we have developed this uh, with lots of consultation and partnership from many folks, um, but it is also now being utilized by Fannie Mae as part of their Healthy Rewards loan product, and that product provides a uh, discount, uh, so basically provide some funding towards resident services if you are course certified. So we encourage um, you to look into that and um, you can be interested or use the course certification whether you're interested in a Fannie Mae product or not. And all of the information is on www.coursonline.org. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to highlight is many of you will have uh, in last spring or summer received our Building to Impact reports. Um, it highlights a lot of the work that SAFE and its members have been doing around how do we measure the impact of this work, of, of services, of affordable housing, and the difference it can make in people's lives. Certainly, that's what we're talking about in detail today, but we wanted to make sure that um, everyone could access this report uh, and um, it's safeimpact.org. So with that, um, we want to get to the meat of our conversation today, and I'm going to introduce Deidre Schmidt, who is the CEO of Common Bond. And just give us one second to change the, uh, who has the mic here? <laughs> so hold on one minute. All right, good morning. Uh, Common Bond, all set to go. Great. Good morning. As Eileen said, my name is Deidre Schmidt, and I'm the CEO here at Common Bond. I'm excited to be here to talk to you about our SROI study uh, on eviction prevention. Uh, you know, at Common Bond, housing stability is really at the heart of all the work we do. And um, our work at Common Bond is close to my heart, personally. When I was 
Very young, my father died, leaving my mom and me alone on our goat farm in western Wisconsin. Uh, during one particularly tough period, my mom and I moved from the farm to a local community uh, where my brother, who was then 23 years old, lived. Uh, in addition to the stress of the move, I was acutely aware of the financial trouble that we were in, and as a result, I stumbled in school. I missed long division, <laughs> and I now have a perfectly fine career, uh, largely based on my ability uh, in the financial area. And so Excel saved me, as it may have saved many of you. Um, but I often think uh, how this could have turned out differently. Um, what if my brother wouldn't have been in a position to help us out? What if I hadn't been a relatively strong student going into that experience? What if we hadn't been part of a white majority community? I think so often about how different my life could have been. And I think perhaps others on this call uh, know something similar. You know, perhaps your kids go to school with kids who uh, were like the childhood version of me. Um, you know, we know that 40% of all Americans can't pull together $400 in the case of an emergency without borrowing. And uh, the majority of our low and moderate income renters are rent burdened. So we know that folks are being impacted by this and that we all are faced with the negative impacts of housing insecurity directly or indirectly. And so these costs are worth understanding in our work. Of course, the most dramatic manifestation of housing instability is eviction. This is something that Common Bond spends a lot of time and energy and money on, and we are good at it. Um, we've done it for a long time. In a recent study uh, in Minneapolis um, eviction court, Common Bond was found to be the most effective large property owner at helping residents avoid eviction. And uh, we wanted to better understand not only our work, but its impact in this area. And so we hired uh, Ernst & Young to help us delve deeper into this and in a different way. We did it not because really we needed a study uh, to know that this was worth investing in, but we did think we could benefit from having a third party, some objective eyes on the matter, asking us to explain our work and understand our work in a different way and helping us understand the impact of that work through a different set of lenses. And we have indeed grown a greater appreciation of our own work and our impact through this. And that's what we want to share with you today. We're thinking of you here really as the interested experts, as the choir, if you will, and we'd like uh, to hear your thoughts on how we can erase awareness and understanding of the importance of housing stability generally and the worthiness of this investment uh, for its social outcomes. But before we do that, I'd like to just start with a quick video that is really intended to introduce folks to the power of housing stability, um, the uninitiated, if you will.
All right, greetings. I, this is Jesse Hendel with Common Bond. Um, I am the Vice President of Advantage Services, and I provide leadership. Uh, Advantage Services is what Common Bond calls our resident services. So I'm going to share a little bit with you today uh, uh, in detail about our SROI. I want to give a quick greeting to those of you on the line who are resident service providers through uh, SAFE organizations. Great to talk to you today. So this is our Advantage Services model. This is how we think about services at Common Bond. I just want to spend a minute on it as it fits into the context of this SROI. So our eviction prevention program is really the core of the work we do across our entire portfolio. We think of it as foundational in that uh, residents have to have stability in place in order to work on other life goals within health and wellness, education and advancement, and to really build community with neighbors. So we focus uh, first and foremost in our work on uh, housing stability and eviction prevention at the core of the model. This SROI really focuses just on our work in eviction prevention. Uh, we're not looking at our outcomes within the other program areas. So I want to spend a moment giving you a sense of who we serve in our eviction prevention program at Common Bond. We serve about 450 households in one year. Average income is $16,000 a year, which is lower than Common Bond's overall average household income of about $21,000 a year, maybe a little higher than that. Um, not surprisingly, it follows kind of the research in the larger field around evictions, but 70% of the households who are at risk of housing instability that we serve are female headed with children, and 80% of those at housing, risk of housing loss are due to financial issues. So what is our eviction prevention program that we're talking about when we are talking about this SROI? The first thing that I think is really important to understand is eviction prevention is what we really call the program area where we're working to prevent negative move out. So really what we measured in this study and what we're meaning when we talk about eviction prevention is preventing people needing to leave our housing due to negative reasons, which in our case, the way we've defined our exit categories are leaving due to a lease violation, unpaid rent, or a skip, which is basically just leaving um, without notice. Um, lease violation exits are often long-term non-compliance with the lease around behaviors, might be housekeeping issues, uh, pretty severe um, types of uh, violations. Though. So really, again, when we talk about this work, it's the prevention of move out due to negative reasons, not just the court-ordered eviction, which is important. What do we mean when we say eviction prevention? Programming at Common Bond? Some of the elements that are part of our eviction prevention program uh, include our property management practices that uh, allow late payments or payment plans, very early and proactive engagement and relationship building with services staff. Eviction prevention for us at Common Bond is almost entirely a one-on-one -on -one model where a services coordinator intervenes early to provide resources and partner with residents and property management to resolve the concern and maintain housing stability. We also think of employment services as part of eviction prevention, and this program area, as, as those of you who work on the ground know, requires a very strong collaboration between the on-site services staff and the on-site property management staff with a shared goal of housing stability. So when we think of eviction prevention at Common Bond, it's both the efforts of services and property management that contribute to the, the outcome of housing stability. What did one, we want to achieve with this SROI? As, as mentioned earlier, we partnered with Ernst & Young on this analysis. We wanted to better understand our role and impact in the community tied to eviction prevention. So we wanted to understand the work beyond our, our doors. We wanted to understand the ripple effects of eviction prevention. We wanted to analyze the short-term outcomes and articulate the long-term impact of our eviction prevention program and understand and communicate the costs and benefits of our work in this space. We really thought that communication of the SROI and, and cost and benefit speaks to a, a unique audience and that having some of this language might help us engage new audiences in understanding the benefits of our work. 
So what was the process with Ernst & Young? It was a, it was a, a lengthy one uh, and involved a lot of uh, data digging internally and externally, a lot of building our understanding and learning as a staff. So the first step was really to do a stakeholder map where we sat in a room and mapped out all of the stakeholders of our eviction prevention work. That's what helped us get to the actual map where we calculated the SROI. So that first step was the stakeholder map. This next step was mapping the short-term outcomes and long-term impacts, basically putting together a theory of change. The next step was a really an internal data step where we needed to pull out all of the data available internally that would help get to the calculation. One of those important data points uh, was what was what is our investment in eviction prevention services. This analysis uh, takes into account what we input, what we what we spend on eviction prevention, and then what the output or the savings is. So we uh, annually invest about 2.6 million dollars in this service area. And then the the step where Ernst & Young primarily took the lead was Ernst & Young uh, going away and doing a lot of research on what kind of externally available or publicly available data they could use to help calculate and describe the social return on investment of our eviction prevention work. So this is really where they went away and found these publicly available data points that back up the SROI. So, drum roll, what did we learn? Um, when it comes to the impact of stable housing, the S SROA analysis estimates that for every dollar invested in our eviction prevention services, the community realizes a return of $4. These benefits include uh, many things, which I'll go through a longer list in a moment, but decreased use of homeless shelters, improved educational outcomes, and lower health healthcare usage. So the SROI calculation included many different uh, data points that got us to our one to four dollar return. They included both uh, impacts that we were able to measure in dollars, where there, you see a list on your screen of those impacts that went into the actual calculation return, as well as some impacts that we weren't able to find um, quantitative data on, but we were able to qualitatively describe the impact. Increased self-agency and self-reliance, increased community well-being and civic engagement. We know are important parts of the theory of change around eviction prevention. There was not uh, internal or external data that we could find that would help us quantitatively articulate the impact, but we were able to qualitatively through resident interviews describe the impact uh, in those outcome areas. <clears throat> um, so I'm gonna take you through uh, example of how the calculation works. Um, can you guys shrink that at all or move it so I can see the plot? <laughs> Thanks, okay. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through the calculation um, here on how a, a piece of the calculation in this SROI works. And for you people on the line who are really interested in data, this is where you'll want to pay uh, close attention. So externally available data tells us that the difference between the annual cost of health care for a person experienced homelessness is $9,000, and the difference for health care for a housed person is $5,000. I'm sorry, the annual cost is $5,000, the difference being $4,000. So we took that $4,000, divided it by 365 days and got the cost differential per day for uh, between a house and a, a homeless individual. Then we could find that the prorated, the number, average number of days in a Minnesota homeless shelter is 34 days. So we multiplied that daily cost for the healthcare difference by 34 days and multiplied that times the average number of residents per unit, 1.8. Then we needed to decide of the households that um, we prevented from homelessness, how many would really become truly homeless and use a shelter if, if they needed to leave common bond housing? And after interviews with staff, we decided on a conservative figure of 10% would actually become homeless and use a home, the homeless system resources. So this 22,334 is the, the value of what is saved 
uh, in this particular outcome area. That list of outcomes we walked through in the slide before, there are similar exercises then that we went through with each of those areas to come up with the cost savings. What did we learn during this process? We learned that SROIs are complex and it, it hurt our heads at some points, um, mostly in a good way, uh, but it was all learning and they're complex. And I think we came out on the other end with a greater understanding of how to think about a return on investment. We also learned that our model of services, and I think many of the service providers on the phone, you know, it's, a, it's, it's all uh, interconnected. It's an ecosystem. It's challenging to measure impact only in one area. Uh, of course it is. People don't leave, live their lives in silos. So to think about this programmatic area and try and isolate or really identify what is truly eviction prevention work was complicated. Um, it, it, I'm sure there are other assumptions we could have made, and it's not, it's not perfect. Uh, we also learned that our impact is greater in communities with fewer alternative resources. Uh, communities that have a, a number of service providers who support eviction prevention work, um, we are one of many players contributing to positive outcomes. In communities that have few resources, we're really what residents are looking for for support. And so we learned that uh, in the analysis. And really, we, we learned, which, which we knew, but it became more, more and more evident that we can't talk about our services work without talking about our property management approach. Services and property management are the two forward-facing resident functions of our organization and really have to work hand-in-hand -hand and, and both have a, a critical part of, of eviction prevention. So what are we asking you to do with this report? Um, I would really hope that you serve as a leader, share this information, share it inside your organization, share it in your networks uh, to gain support for housing stability in your communities. Uh, use this data to help think about public policy. What else can we be doing in our communities to support housing stability with all, all community members? And, um, really thinking about how this can become more part of the conversation in our communities. So I think we're going to um, move to question and question Q&A now. Uh, we can dig into parts of the report that you have a specific interest in, depending on what questions you have. So I'm going to introduce uh, Derek now. Derek Madsen is the Executive Vice President of Resource Development for Common Bond, and he's going to help us uh, with the Q&A. Hello everyone, thanks for being with us today to learn about this important work. Uh, I'll just remind you that you can ask questions via the chat function uh, by asking them to the organizers and panelists, um, or feel free to just punch them into all if you don't mind folks seeing it. And we'll see it here on the chat function and ask the questions. So one question um, that I'll start off with Jesse uh, that came in is, you talked a lot about common bond and making conservative assumptions when you were walking through one example calculation there. Can you talk a little bit about other examples of where that was done and why the assumptions, why you made the assumptions that you did? Sure. So I gave the example earlier about making the conservative estimate that 10% of those we serve in eviction prevention would have become homeless if not uh, from from as a result of housing instability. Yes, another example would be uh, I showed earlier the amount we invest in eviction prevention services, and you know we don't we don't budget by program areas like eviction prevention. We really had to go through and come up with our with strategies to estimate the cost of program areas based on salaries. So in, again, in that area, we took a look at uh, estimates of time spent by services and property management staff and the salaries in those areas, and really went with a middle of the road time assumption. We had uh, Ernst and Young helped us think about whenever we had to do something that wasn't as scientific, um, coming up with a low estimate, a middle estimate, and a high estimate, 
And then they, they'd help us think about it in those three categories. So what is a ge very generous estimate of how much time maybe one service coordinator spends on eviction prevention? What is the kind of most generous? What is the most conservative? And then they'd often lead us to go in, in the middle. So I think there were a number of times through the analysis where um, we kind of thought about our estimations in different categories and then would go for the more conservative value. You know, I think why we did why we did these this way and why why be conservative? Um, part of an SROI has some actual methodologies that you go through to, in fact, make your estimate more conservative and make them more um, real for what your organization can actually claim credit for, which uh, different from what could be credited to other organizations. Can you go back to the slides for a minute? Just want to pull one thing up real quick. One of those examples is an exercise, an SROI help, has you go through called uh, looking at the attribution. No, at the end, sorry. Um, yes. So attribution is another piece that uh, actually makes your uh, SROI more conservative, and that asks you to think about Attribution asks you to think about what is something your organization can take credit for versus what is something that could have been attributed to the work of other organizations. Um, and I'll, I'll just show you that by thinking about attribution, this idea of um, attribution is how we actually came to the understanding that, in fact, while we share that our overall SROI is one to $4, it's actually different by state when we take a look at this idea called attribution. So while uh, the average, again, is one to four, when we look at attribution, what does the organization take credit for versus what could be credited to other organizations? We actually thought about, uh, we got came to an SROI different for our three different states of service. And that's because they the analysis in the analysis, we gave Common Bond a lower attribution, i.e. credit for the SROI. In Minnesota, where we have a uh, overall stronger safety net, than in the, the states of Wisconsin and Iowa, where overall we uh, often find ourselves as one of the primary resources residents go for to for eviction prevention. So that was a little more answer to your question, but. Um, this idea of attribution is important when you think about um, making your estimates conservative. So I think, thanks for that, Jesse. I think that really got to a question that we found, uh, that we got through the chat, which was about the impact of the interventions in different places in different contexts. So how we show up as an organization, our model for eviction prevention is uniform. However, the way that it interacts with the community and the service providers around us creates different value for different communities. Right. Uh, there's another question I'd like to just turn to to ask Deidre, um, because I know that the work that we've done in Milwaukee and how this is intertwined with some policy efforts has some specific implications. But the question is, what do you think the policy or practice implications are for this report? Maybe if we could dig a little bit into Milwaukee specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as I said, we <clears throat> started this work because we wanted to better understand our work and our impact and how we interface with systems um, in the communities that we work in. And so as a perfect example, we took uh, about midstream through this work, started working with a group of collaborat collaborators, a couple of dozen organizations in Milwaukee who were concerned with what sort of efforts and resources were available in that community to help people maintain housing stability. Um, as you can imagine, they've gotten a lot of attention after Matt Desmond's book, which we can all admit really could have been cited anywhere in any of our large communities across the country. So uh, this is a community where, as Jesse said, we took greater credit, more attribution, because we knew we were among a smaller set of resources, both um, practical and financial, to help folks uh, make it through periods that would challenge their housing stability. And with that group, 
uh, we really came to diagnose a few um, major barriers um, to housing stability in that community um, by understanding what each of these independent actors was offering to folks who were facing those periods of housing instability. And as a result of that community systems mapping exercise, as a group, we've recommended a number of different actions, and I guess the two I would highlight, one seems very basic to man many of us, is the creation of a housing court. So currently in Milwaukee, if you're faced with the prospect of eviction, your case is uh, heard alongside any number of other uh, legal cases that go in front of a judge that has no particular expertise in, in housing issues. Uh, and then the second was the creation of a greater and more diverse pool of emergency financial assistance resources for folks uh, facing eviction. And it was really intriguing to see that some of the gaps of the folks that could be served through the existing resources were not understood until that group got together. So as much as we're trying to use this sort of analysis uh, to, again, understand where we fit in and the relative impact of our work. It's also about understanding ourselves as a piece of a greater system. Good. Thank you. Um, another question that's come in is about the four to one and who realizes the value of the four. And the question is, um, the study found a four dollar return for each dollar invested. How much of that four dollars is returned to common bond? And Jesse, you know, what we understand about the SROI is that that is actually realized by the community, not directly by the organization. So can you talk a little bit about the diversity of organizations that are that we're seeing the community realize this benefit through the other places sure. have those calculations? Sure. So I think the benefit is realized through improved educational outcomes. Uh, the benefit is realized through reduced cost of health care to the health care payer. Uh, the benefit is reduced shelter costs. Uh, the benefit could is even future earning potential of the resident. So having housing stability, you know, there's data that would say you, your longer term earning potential is higher. Um, decreased uh, spending by the resident on housing dollars. So if you get evicted, the likelihood that you'll have to pay a higher rent in the future. So it, it primarily the, the return is realized by, again, this map of all the different stakeholders, uh, many of whom are government, uh, some of who are different private business. The stakeholder map um, are all those stakeholders are realizing the return. If you look at the full report, there is the stakeholder map is in there and there's a full map of where the return is realized uh, to what entity. And so it's not directly to common bond, right. it's more so to the residents and to the communities that we serve. Right. Right. Thank you. Um, there is a question in here about um, the 2.656 million in investment. Um, and there's also another related question that asks about some of the other programs that we offer, the community building and other things. Can you just clarify a little bit more about what that 2.6 million in investment, yeah. uh, how that how that's realized with residents, and what other services wrap around them, and what the difference is? Sure. So 2.6 million is what we as as Common Bond invest in eviction prevention services. That's primarily staff salaries in both our services area and in property management. It's more primarily services staff salary. It's a smaller percentage of property management time, but um, you know we realize that property management staff absolutely are helping put together payment plans and provide resources to people. So it's staff salaries and a small bit of office space, but the primary cost to provide this service is it's very person intensive is staff salaries in this program area. Uh, you know the rest of our approach, as I mentioned. Uh, we, our, our core uh, staffing position at a site is called an Advantage Services Coordinator, which is similar to other uh, organizations who use a service coordination approach. And that individual at the property does this housing stability services or eviction prevention. 
but then also provides, depending on the needs and resources of the community, various programs that were outlined in that circle. So in addition to the housing stability work, they might provide a youth after school program. They're doing uh, community building, helping neighbors get to know each other, helping neighbors build leadership skills and figure out what their goals are for their own community and how to, how to realize those. And then uh, some communities, uh, depending on the demographics and what folks are interested in, we'll do some health and wellness classes or various programs. So, so really we have an integrated approach across these various uh, priority areas that you saw in the circle with the core work being housing stability in the center of the model. That's what costs 2.6 million is that core housing stability work. Thank you. Uh, Deidre, there's a question about, um, about the study and some of the non-quantifiable impacts and also about the longevity, kind of the, the period of impact that we're realizing this over. Could you just share a little bit about what we learned through this study about um, specifically the duration of impact and how long it is? Um, and then maybe touch a little bit more on how we might view ourselves continuing to look at some of those non-quantifiable things or other areas we now want to study as a result of what we've learned. Hmm. I think Jesse actually has a slide that's prepared that, that mm. makes uh, crystal clear what is our kind of capture period. And, and this is an area where, again, we chose to be very conservative. You know, most of us, I'm sure, on the phone here today know that the um, negative impacts of an eviction or severe housing instability can be multi-generational. You know, you see evidence like the statistic that you're 48% less likely to um, graduate from high school if you have even one negative move during your childhood. And so we know that the, the long-term impacts of housing stability are really dramatic. However, we felt that for the purposes of our learning, and again, for the purposes of helping use this as a device to educate others who are potentially not sensitive to these issues, that we would be better off capturing a much shorter period of benefit uh, so that it could be more easily understood and more defensible. And so we really just tried to capture those outcomes that were measurable for the period of time that folks live with us and then six months after that stay. Um, again, plenty of reason to believe and understand how uh, you know, these benefits really accrue long, long term. Uh, and then as for what is next, um, you know, I think this has been a really interesting uh, process for us. You know, we've oftentimes used the analogy of getting a degree. So, you know, you, when you get a degree, you get a diploma, you put it on the wall, it's a credential that you can use, and it's a great investment, but what you really pay for in tuition is the learning process that you go through. And so I think we as an organization have become clearer in um, a number of different things that Jesse talked about. I would say the number one uh, thing that's become clearer for us internally is really how critical our housing and services approach, the property management and services being on the same team approach, is to being able to be effective in this work. And that there is cost to that. That our property managers react differently than most property managers in the markets we serve anyway. Um, when a household is facing housing instability. And there is a cost to that for us. And we know that in a very different way than we did before. It also allows us to talk to those staff differently about where their value proposition is in the organization. And I would see that on a continuing basis, we can get better at communicating to our own staff, including all the folks that might be on the call today, <laughs> about um, what they're bringing to the table and the impact they're having beyond just making Common Bond a more stable organization and our individual residents' lives more stable. We are having an incredible uh, ripple effect into the community. Whether or not we would do an additional SRI formal study, I think is you know, yet to be decided as an organization. But I can say that this type of, um, of uh, understanding and manipulation of our own data and seeking to benchmark that against and understand how it fix, fits in with you know, peer-reviewed research, et cetera, is something that we're definitely um, looking to do more of in the future. 
I want to follow up on one piece you touched on there relative to a question that was sent, which is about our work with state housing finance agencies. For those who are, you know, housing with services providers, our peers on the call, they probably have a little bit more insight. But for those who are maybe interested in this work and not in it day to day, can you talk just very briefly about our work that you just talked about, our combination of housing and services? What's funded kind of in partnership through housing service, housing finance agencies, and then how we're coming to the table to add value with these types of services in our model. So um, if I'm understanding what you're looking for, you know, we have a whole menu of services and, um, and depth of services that we tailor for the needs of folks on any one site. Um, and we pay for that kind of tailored set of services through a number of different means. You know, when we're really lucky, we can structure a housing development that has some capacity to pay for services in its original financial structuring, um, either above or below the line for folks that that makes any sense to um, with our funder and investor partners. Um, we also do have some contracts with government entities that are either structured as grants but have earnouts or are actual service contracts. So there's some earned income in the services space. Um, actually, it's also worth noting that we provide um, fee for service social services and coordination uh, to both non and for profit property owners. Um, that we collaborate with, as well as our property management, which we do for third parties. So again, in our kind of core set of um, value propositions or offerings in the property management side include some of this work. Uh, so there's earned income in that way. And then finally, um, we do a lot of fundraising every year. And so you'll notice that the end of our video has a little bit of a fundraising tone to it. It's partly to alert people to the importance of this work, and a second to make uh, clear that people understand that their support of us helps to support this work. Thank you. Um, there are a couple questions about the study and the methodology. So one first, can you just tell us, Jesse, briefly, there's a question about the number of evictions prevented. So could you give folks a sense of the time period over which we were looking at data in regard to this uh, evaluation, the number of total evictions that were considered um, and just a, a little bit more about the timing of the period of examination. Sure. So we actually um, looked at uh, data of our course of three years. So it was 2015 through 2017. Things you see are average annual amounts. So we looked at a three-year period and then kind of annualized it. Um, but in any one year, we uh, tend to work with 400, 450 households and prevent about 85% of those evictions or really, again, just as a reminder, negative turnovers are what we're looking to prevent. So we, we prevent somewhere in the three, 340 range uh, of, of housing exits. Um, so, and again, over the course of three years. This is how Ernst & Young really led us through the process that they wanted to look at more than one year of data to see more what our overall trend was. So it was a three year period. Thanks. Um, and then there's a question that's come in that's about our work with Ernst & Young. So can, can you just chat briefly about, you know, we, we talked about the fact that we work closely with them, mm -hmm. but you know, who was responsible for devising the methodology? Who was responsible for conducting the analysis, and what was the role of staff, and what was the role of folks from Ernst & Young that we contracted with? So Ernst & Young really brought the methodology, brought the understanding and experience with the method, uh, methodology. Um, they led us through what kind of internal data and, and um, perspective was needed. They did all of the calculations. Um, you know, there were many times where we would have a conversation to go over the calculations. It was very important to them that we both understood the methodology they were moving through, but they really brought the methodology and did the calculations uh, to the process, as well as um, a, a big chunk of their work was finding the uh, publicly available sort of data to be used to come up with the cost 
savings. So those things about what is the cost savings, what is the cost of health care for a house person versus a homeless individual, an individual experiencing homelessness, excuse me. Um, and so they really did all of that finding the uh, publicly available data. Great. Um, seems like the questions have slowed down. If there are any that folks want to ask last minute, please punch them in. Uh, otherwise, we may close with this as our final question uh, before we turn it back over uh, to our friends at SAFE or, or just draw to a close on time. Um, can you talk a little bit about how we view housing stability as contributing to strong communities? What is the real value of housing stability to residents, um, to communities, and do you see it as an equity issue? Uh, yes, absolutely. It is an equity issue. Um, you know, for those of you who haven't read Matt Desmond's book, Evicted, yet, he makes a very strong argument based on his findings in that community and others that um, eviction is most is more predominantly the effects of eviction are felt most predominantly in African American communities. I think he says something like. Eviction is to African American women what incarceration is to African American men. So, uh, and I, you know, everything we see is absolutely um, consistent with his observations on that. And so, when we look at the impacts to the broader community, we know that um, uh, this is an equity investment for us. Um, the first part of your question was about uh, how housing stability contributes to uh, strong communities. Right. So, you know, this is a one dimensional assessment of the community impact of housing stability. It, it really, as Jesse said earlier, only seeks to capture those things that we can, and that more importantly, Ernst and Young can say with. Uh, with real confidence are financial outcomes that benefit the broader community. And Jesse had two points at the bottom there of things that we could find evidence of, but not a price tag, right? You couldn't monetize as easily. Um, but we know that these impacts, that that list of things that are not monetizable, it's actually a very long list. And particularly if we allow ourselves to think about uh, a longer horizon or catchment period for the benefits. Um, you know, the thing that I keep coming back to is thinking about um, this, this idea that um, housing stability, instability has multi-generational negative impacts. You know, it's been proven that uh, children of eviction are more likely to suffer from depression, to be uh, evicted themselves. You know, these are things that we didn't even try to touch in this study and we know to be true. And so um, we feel really proud that our organization has made this level of investment in benefiting surrounding communities and, and will continue to do so as, as long as we possibly can. Um, one of the other pieces that I often think about is, um, you know, current, like how is this impacting folks that might think that they're insulated from it? So this indirect and more immediate impact of housing instability Talking to a dear friend of mine, a teacher the other day was describing trying to keep the focus of a classroom of students when she has a child who's trying to take a nap in the back of the room because he slept in his car the night before. So, you know, anyone who has a child in the public school system in any probably major community across our country can be confident that they are having, they are experiencing indirectly the impacts of housing instability. Um, again, back to my own personal story, knowing that, um, you know, the long-term impacts in my life of having experienced housing instability, it makes me very confident that um, these investments are important to make, that, the, that we can only really know the very top portion of this iceberg. Um, Good. Thank you. Um, Deidre, I'm going to close with this as our final question and look to you to wrap. And the question is, how long do you recommend an organization expect to pass between thinking up an SROI topic and structuring the study, selecting someone, undertaking it, completing it? So maybe a little bit about what we saw so that folks who might be in, in, you know, entertaining yeah. the idea of their own SROI. Well, you know, your results will differ. <laughs> um, I was first inspired to do this study 
when I went to an international housing partnership meeting in Ottawa. Uh, there was a Canadian nonprofit that did, that worked with this work group in Ernst & Young, who, by the way, were also based in Canada, most of them. Um, and I think that was three years ago. And we really didn't start, so we had the glimmer of an idea, but we really didn't start to do the work in earnest until a couple years ago. So I would say two years made sense for us. Um, you know, organizations might be in a different starting place. Uh, we had a lot of really good data, and we've been collecting data on our effort in efforts to outcomes on our social services stuff for a long time. But we had to do some work to make sure that we were capturing the efforts of our property management teams in a way that could support this. Um, and also, I'd just like to say that, you know, this is work that we did in addition to the everyday work of the organization. And so I think the pace um, of an organization's process, progress through this process would also depend on how much capacity they can break free from doing the actual work to take the step back and understand it. Okay, so um, I, this is Deidre again. Really just wanna thank everyone um, for joining us today. And I really wanna ask you to help us continue this um, this idea of leveraging the efforts, right? So we came up with this uh, leverage of one or four dollars for every one dollar, and I'd really like to ask all of you to please share uh, the concept of the work that we talked about today with at least four people. Um, the idea here is really to um, work together to describe to the public why investing in housing stability is not only what I believe morally and practically the right thing to do, but that it is also economically, financially the right investment, that it's good not only for the direct beneficiary resident owners like ourselves, but as this SRI study illustrates, also for the general public. Uh, so please help us um, share this word and hopefully in support of the work that you do that's similar in your own communities. Um, while always having the disclaimer that your results will vary. Um, the webinar, all of the presentation items here uh, will be available to you, and the webinar will be posted on our Common Bonds YouTube channel um, in the near future. So thank you very much for joining us today.